How safe is your money when you don't have it in your pocket? How soundly do you sleep at night knowing that your hard-earned savings are entrusted with institutions you do not control? Where do you start when you learn that a bank has collapsed with your life savings? In the blink of an eye, life savings can be lost. Entire businesses ground to a halt, unable to pay anyone. After its board and asked a president, after more than 50,000 people unable to get access to their money. Imperial Bank shareholders have moved to court, challenging the liquidation of the bank by the Central Bank of Kenya. The impact of that closure and what it's having on the lives of those affected is extremely heavy. Attacked depositors from rogue bank officials affected by the closure of banks to safeguard against future malpractice. We must now strengthen and remove the weaknesses in our banking system. The money that I had deposited was meant for my health. Well, well now, now I'm 86 years old. I'm sick. I had an operation in my back and, and I, I need money. And now the, the, the they took all my for my work of 65 years. And somebody is telling you, you cannot be able to access your money. How? You know, you're in a trance and I have not done anything illegal that I, I cannot access my money. Again, it's not my fault that the bank has collapsed. It's somebody else's fault inside the bank. It's like telling me I cannot get inside my own house. In 2015, I had won a very huge award, uh, 15 million. Kenya shillings. It had all been transferred into Imperial Bank. So when IBL closed, it meant that I had lost my money, I had lost organization money. Um, I remember like Sami, Sami was an eight-year-old boy who was positive for lead poisoning. And uh, him and some other children, we had put them on, uh, on home care to help them, uh, help their bodies naturally get um, rid of the lead. Finally, Sami died in hospital. I, I was very bitter at that point. I remember writing to uh, the CBK governor, Professor Njeroke, at that time. I wrote an email and I sent him some of his pictures. And I told him, you, you have overseen the death of this child and many other children in Oinoru. Because I had to stop their medication drastically. I lost uh, equivalent in Kenya shillings, one billion shillings. Now, if you calculate the interest still now, the amount would have gone further 75%. The Kenya Tea Development Agency, the agency tasked with overseeing the processing, sales and marketing of tea produce from 66 factories run by over 600,000 small-scale tea farmers, has been affected by this twice. It lost 2.9 billion shillings and another 1.9 billion shillings in Imperial Bank and Chase Bank respectively in just six months. Now, the trickle-down effect of the collapse of the commercial lenders have a grave impact on the economy, but this is a trend, it's a cycle that recurs every 10 years. In the last three decades, about 36 Kenyan banks have collapsed, each shaking the economy to its core. In the first wave of failures, which lasted from 1984 to 1989, the banks that failed were owned by individuals that had excessive risk to single, powerful borrowers. One, in fact, had most of its loan book to its own chairman, who was a government minister. The second wave lasted from 1992 to 1995. It had all the hallmarks of the corruption of the day. The cascade eased, but only temporarily. The third wave began in 1998, and within a short time, it triggered a banking crisis that did not abate until the new millennium. The fall of Eurobank and the start of the NARC era marks the start of the fourth wave. The last bank in this cascade, Charterhouse Bank, collapsed in 2006 under a cloud of suspicion of every imaginable crime in the business of banking. When I came in, you know, Eurobank had just, had just collapsed with a lot of money from the parastatals. And that one was, was already a fait complaint as I walked in. It's the most, it's one of the biggest 
problems I confronted as I walked into the position of governor. And then my problem was, what can you do? You know, what can you do? So immediately I started looking at other banks to identify possibilities of collapse, just similar to the Eurobank. And we did a quick assessment of the capacity of the commercial banks too. And obviously there were some. We found that there were just, there were just uh, uh, shells. And those I'm lucky. The president, I went to the president and argued my case for making sure that we, re we remove them from the banking sector as institutions because are not, they were not viable. I don't want to mention names, but about 11 of them, we had to bring them down because we found that they were really shells. They were not banks. Failure is often an excellent learning opportunity. And when it comes to bank failures, Kenya has decades worth of experiences to learn from. But what lessons, if any, have really been learned here? But let me start with the one that is not documented. Greed. Greed. Greed is a major source of a bank failure. Why do I say greed? Greed is because the laws are very clear. The laws to set up a commercial bank are laid out in law. The laws to manage and operate a bank properly and efficiently is also laid out in law. If you do not follow carefully all the stipulations in law, you are risking the possibility that your institution could fail. Banks are unique type of, type of business. That's why they're highly regulated. And the reason being, we handle people's money. We handle people's money, and that's really all we do. We don't make widgets, we don't make anything else. It's just money. You know, there are certain controls you must have in place, and those controls can only be enforced if there is good governance. When governance fails, then controls cannot be enforced. The reasons had more to do with uh, generally weaknesses in corporate governance. Um, poor or weak regulatory environment. For example, you could have politicians instructing a bank or managing director of a bank to not cause problems to a borrower if that borrower is linked to the politicians. You know, he goes to the politician, says that I'm being troubled. These people want, you know, to, they have asked me to pay up and they're not giving me time. And then you receive a call. You are told, no, 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 please take time with this particular one. That has happened in history. That has happened. And we all know that has happened in history. That risks the bank. Eh? Involvement of politicians in decision making of the banks themselves. The president that time asked for a loan for the election and it was there. And I've, I've How much it. did you give But you see, to the former president? I've said it was 4.2 billion for the election. You gave 4.2 billion shillings to Kanu. Yes. How much did Fort you give Kenya, Fort Kenya? Fort Kenya was uh, only about 2 million. I have seen, for example, in my time, managers of commercial banks or directors of commercial banks who will not be true to proper management of the bank. They will be agreeing with their shareholders or others to do it in a manner that actually digresses away from what they are required to do. The political interference. You've got institutions that are out and placed in, under the law to manage banks. And one of the most important of these institutions is the central bank. And the central bank has got the tools to be able to ensure that a bank is done well. But if there is political interference and compromises the capacity of the central bank to carry out its functions, then you can also see a possibility that, that this will happen. That will be risking possible collapse of a commercial bank. In less than a year, beginning in mid-2015, the central bank placed three commercial banks in receivership in quick succession. The immediate effect of the latest cycle of bank collapse is felt in the entire financial sector, bringing other small and mid-tier banks to their knees, to the very brink, really, of collapse. 
Dubai Bank, by far the smallest bank when it collapsed, was built on a shaky foundation. The cracks first started showing and the bank's chairman, Hassan Zubaydi, fired the managing director at the time, Nerea Saeed, after she accused him of abetting fraud and theft of clients' funds at the bank. Still, despite that court case, the bank operated for three more years before the Central Bank of Kenya moved in to do its job. In the end, the bank was liquidated. On the specifics, Dubai Bank is straightforward. Uh, we put it in receivership, we put it in uh, liquidation. The reasons behind its closure were clear. You know, a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, fraud, embezzlement, money laundering. Um, so the charge sheet is clear and uh, we need to deal with them appropriately. Next on the chopping block was Imperial Bank, which was by then a thriving mid-tier bank. It took the Central Bank of Kenya three years to react to a whistleblower's email that had been sent to them in October 2012 about fraudulent dealings at the bank. It was the bank shareholders who reported the discovery of a fraudulent scheme that had been used to move about 34 billion shillings at the bank over 12 years. It is the shareholders' protracted fight to have the bank resolved that has, for the very first time, given us a glimpse of what really goes on at the Central Bank of Kenya. Confidence in the rigor and strength of a banking sector. And we will continue to monitor and oversee full compliance of existing regulations. Farm action will be taken against those who have abused their fiduciary positions of management of our financial sector. Individual banks can and will fail. It goes back to the objectives of supervision. As I said, uh, you, you don't supervise to guarantee no failures. So ultimately, when the bank has a problem, the most important job for CBK is to make sure that there is no effect on the rest of the system. Because CBK looks after the whole system. Okay? So the macro prudential uh, issues are more important than the micro prudential issues. At that particular time, you're looking at the effect on the system. Then the second objective is to make sure that once there is a problem on the bank, then how, how do you do it in an orderly fashion? And how do you make sure the depositors who have got insurance are basically protected? Chase Bank first suffered a raft of rumors before full bank run took effect as wary depositors withdrew their savings. The external auditor, Deloitte, had revised its view on the bank's books, with the biggest change being a massive increase in internal loans. Those restated numbers showed it had underreported loans by 8 billion shillings. This story that this was all Sharia compliant lending and all that, that's all rubbish. There's no such thing like that. Um, not about this. This was, you know, my example here. Well, this was on. I, I lend you 14 billion, right? Because, you know, 14 billion. You happen to be a director, so that's not a problem. 14 billion, you're going nowhere, right? Uh, but what, do you sign a little piece of paper that says you owe me uh, 14 billion? Nah, I mean, you're going nowhere. And, uh, and then you, uh, what's the, do you give me any uh, security? No, you're going nowhere, I know you. Uh, and, uh, and then also, what about the interest payments? No, why do you need to do interest payments? And so when am I gonna get, get the money back? Uh, when am I gonna give you the money back? Well, maybe in 14 years. You see what I'm saying? So if you got a deal like that, and anyway, I think I have said enough about that. <laughs> that is your Sharia compliant rubbish that they were talking about, okay? If this isn't clear what was going on, then I don't know what will ever be. During his vetting, Kenya's ninth and current central bank governor, Dr. Patrick Jaroge, shocked but impressed the country with his austere lifestyle. The collapse of the three banks right after he was appointed to head the Central Bank of Kenya was seen as him making good on his promise to clean up the sector. When you lose your money under these circumstances, who do you run to? 
That is now KDIC. We don't want banks to come to terminal that is brought to us for us to maybe now to apply the burial rights on that bank, no. Now our role has changed. We have now become the surgeons and the doctors of these banks. We'll be involved in the examination with the central bank. We'll be doing off-site inspections. In the unlikely event of a closure, we want to promise Kenya that we shall expeditiously, expeditiously resolve. That's why we call a resolution authority, resolve that bank. So, so far we have liquidated about 25 institutions, out of which eight we have already terminated the liquidation. We have completed the liquidation. We still have 17 which are still under liquidation with us. We in KDIC, we are ready to be as transparent as possible. One of our pillars of our strategic plan is enhance public awareness. There was no information or you being updated that you can do A, B, C, D, maybe get an email, get a text or anything. I saw it on TV. You see, I could go all the time to a Chase Bank ATM, put my ATM, see if anything will come out. Even if there's something uh, in a particular institution, obviously I, I'll always say I cannot comment on those things. That was yesterday morning where the governor refuted claims that Chase Bank was facing liquidity flow problems. This morning the script had changed. This institution would have survived, would have continued to work. If they had actually recognized this thing, I mean these loans, they would have dealt with them. And uh, it would have, because in a sense it would have been cleaning their balance sheet. Experts now say that his handling of the situation exposed his lack of understanding of the Kenyan banking ecosystem. At the time when Chase Bank was closed, uh, the CBK had no board. How do you then ask other banks to first have a board and for then that board to have a good oversight of what's happening in the bank? Chase Bank, I think, was an overreaction by the, by the central bank. Issues in the Chase Bank did not warrant a closure. Those are things that could be addressed. Chess Bank, in my view, could have been saved. It should not have even been uh, closed. Yes, it had issues. It had corporate governance issues. You, you are the lender of last resort. Uh, maybe could, it, could, could CBK have done more to try and save the bank than to try and now revive it? But in the last couple of years, um, in the case of Imperial Bank and um, Chase Bank and so forth, I would think it's the manner in which the central bank uh, address some of the um, issues of compliance that precipitated the crisis. Between one to ten I can give them a four because one, like I said, nobody was giving information on, on what is going on. And uh, I will not really say they did a good job. There was nothing particularly shocking um, about Imperial Bank. As I said, the, the failure of governance is not necessarily the failure of operations. And what we looked at were operations. Uh, we were not just looking at the governance failures. The so-called toxic assets were kept out of our purview. We didn't see those. Yeah? We didn't get to examine these so-called WETL assets, for example. We didn't look at them. We were not given access to them. Um, so what we saw was actually a fairly balanced and good bank. I mean, that's what we saw. And because the bank had no liquidity problem, it was very strong, except for the fraudulent activities that have been exposed. There was no reason in terms of the financials, really, to uh, justify the closure of the bank. And the directors then got even companies that were interested to take over the bank and buy it immediately. I've gone myself, I've seen the proposals from a number of... Uh, major financial institutions that wanted to buy them and so that the bank would continue. The government can do the investigation on the people who are involved in the uh, illegal activities. But the central bank would not hear any of it. For central bank to close down a bank when they have not done any investigations and to straight away close down and again Imperial Bank was liquid the time they closed. They had 40 billion shillings. So it was a very premature step taken by Central Bank. Number two, the receiver manager who was appointed was under investigations in Central Bank. Even if they were supposed to bring any receivers, they should have brought from outsiders. 
but not people from central bank to create more fraud within the banking sector. I think CBK needs to up its game, uh, honestly. I think when you supervise banks, uh, you tell them to do certain things. One of the things you ask banks to do is, for example, corporate governance. If you have yourself problems with corporate governance, you're not going to implement corporate governance rules uh, in the banking system. Uh, you have to have the moral authority to tell someone else to do something. Uh, if you're not doing that yourself, then we have a big problem. I don't know how CBK operates, and I don't know the uh, guidelines, what they, what they should do when it comes to the banking industry. If they can be having normal audits per month, if they had done that, they would have detected the sickness beforehand. The first thing is they should have been transparent. The secrecy with which the regulator had previously handled the receiverships and liquidations has only started coming to light now thanks to the volumes of documents filed in court after the recent collapse of the three banks. In particular, Imperial Bank, whose shareholders have made it their business to fight a possible liquidation. Imperial Bank shareholders, on the other hand, have been extremely confrontational. Extremely. It's not an issue of money, they are people of means. Okay, so you think you have the 10 billion? Bring it here. I need sight of it. Have they done that? The answer is zero, nada, zilch. Over the past few weeks, um, I think it is common knowledge that we are having challenges in dialoguing with the central bank and with KDIC. But we are hoping, as I said earlier, that we can come to a situation where we can sit across the table and dialogue. Shareholders have a right to know what happens to their institutions. Um, if they are guilty of any crime, they should be charged in court. And they're, you know, that, that's, that's, that's the law. If, if, if there's any fraudulent activity by anyone, appropriate assets of, of the shareholders and put it on the market uh, without their involvement. I, I think at the end of, the, when this thing ends, especially the, this one of uh, Imperial, I think government would, would, would end up paying a lot of money. There's something that these people are not being very transparent about and people can sense that. And in business, you don't go into something when it's not transparent enough. You have to have confidence in anywhere you're putting your money. Nobody's aware of what is happening. We as depositors deserve to know. Those that, mis you know, that were misbehaved, meaning were involved in the fraud and all that, yeah, we hold them accountable. That's part of the governance that we're talking about. Now I know in all the 50 years of our independence, uh, there's been a lot of fraud, there's been a lot of uh, embezzlement, in banks, banks have fallen, closed. But how many of those people are held accountable? Actually, not a single one of them has ever been to jail. Now you could say, well, maybe the cases are weak, blah, 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 but I think I don't need to say anymore. There are things that we need to deal with as a people, um, but from our perspective, we will do what we can uh, to make sure that the, the, the investigation is done correctly, the matter, is the evidence is clear and this can then be brought to a court of law that will do it, deal with it fairly and uh, lead to the prosecution and uh, yeah and uh, jailing of these people. I mean sure bank executives were hauled before court and parliamentary committees after some banks failed but no one, no executive, no board member, no one was ever jailed or punished for what has happened. A good number, in fact, either emigrated or stayed under the radar, safe from repercussions. Imperial Bank wasn't just home to the country's 17th largest bank and some 50,000 clients. It was also home to a significant shadow bank too. According to published financials, Imperial Bank had about 55 billion shillings in deposits. However, when the bank was placed in receivership and the deposits were manually tallied, it was discovered that the bank was actually under-reporting its deposits. The number ballooned by nearly 30 billion shillings. Officially, the bank reported that it had a loan book of 40 billion shillings. The group managing director was the only executive who also sat on the board. He kept the shadow bank 
secret, hiding its details away from his other shareholders and board members as well. According to the FDI Consulting Forensic Audit Draft shared with the Central Bank of Kenya, the firm identified 23 entities that deposited cash into IBL, perhaps for the shadow bank. The counterparties operated in various countries and various sectors. Over the period under study, accounts for W.E. Tilly received inflows of over 28.8 billion shillings. I would not have been surprised that, for example, W.E. Tilly would still be around. I would not be surprised. And they would stay on like Imperial without, if the regulator is not very serious about these matters, they can continue. They can continue on. It is really, it really depends very much on the commitment of the regulator to really unearth and run a clean banking system. A single TT of $40 million, which came at Diamond Trust by the same people Tilly, the fish people, and no queries were raised that what was the incoming of $40 million at Diamond Trust Bank. Because if they would have looked into that, that would have led them to a lot of things what is happening in this banking sector. Again, if you look at the money channel from Imperial Bank to Diamond Trust Bank to Fidelity Bank, the Tilly people were the shareholders in F uh, Fidelity Bank. So all this money moving under money laundering, nobody has questioned anything. Everything has been covered up. What you're about to hear is a conversation between the bank's chairman, Al Nashir Popat, Anwar Haji, one of the independent directors, and the bank's chief financial officer, James Kaburu. This was recorded on the 24th of September, 2015, three days after the executives had reported to the board scanty details of their fraudulent scheme. James, were you aware that he was forging board papers? Board papers? That one, that one, I what? don't know. You don't know? No, I don't know that one. Because then, my papers are as by my accounts. That one, the point is, I don't know how to admit it. Because then, if you had to, for example, I can both the 10, 50, whatever it is, mm -hmm. that's, that's now the right for me. Mm -hmm. James, was he asking you personally yes. to bribe uh, KRA and uh, yes. And central bank? How do I get the money, Mr. Popat? He gave you the money? Yes. I but where did you draw this money from? I don't know. That's Naim now to answer. Naim was drawing the money? Yes. I don't know Naim used to get the money from. That one but you were the financial controller. For the show purpose, the Tilly people have been charged in the court. Up to now, the case is not moving because there are external forces who are stopping this case not to move, who is protecting all these things. It looks like it's from Central Bank because they are the ones who are supposed to charge them. And nothing has happened. A, a regulator can never be seen or heard or even imagined to be anywhere close to a head of a commercial bank. The governor, his wife, were looked after by the managing director of Imperial Bank up to the extent that they were paid their air tickets to Thailand and paid all the expenses. Why would they need those favours? Why would a governor accept those favours? They are not supposed to take any favours from any individual. They are supposed to follow the laid down procedure. The shareholders filed a defence and counterclaim suit in response to an application by KDIC to freeze their assets as part of their evidence, IBL's directors submitted emails between the CFO and CBK staff. In it, the CFO tells the Central Bank of Kenya official to delete some data from a list of the bank's top 50 borrowers. Naeem Shah, formerly head of credit and now Yan Mohammed's successor, had kept notes from the former managing director which instructed management to move cash around, off the books, for a range of clients. The biggest of those was W. E. Tilly. David and evidence provided placed the blame on CBK staff for, among other things, inspection breaches, further breaches relating to the whistleblower emails, the transacting of personal favours, a failure to remove Yan Mohammed and his co-conspirators from office, further failures with respect to how they handled office holders, auditor breaches, post-receivership breaches. 
Evidence filed in court shows that the regulator had visibility on the activities of both banks, the one we hear about and the shadow bank. IBL staff, with the help of CBK colleagues, would fudge, tinker with a list of borrowers, hiding some away from board scrutiny and reducing some loans for the ones they would disclose to the board. Email correspondence shows that the following staff were part of the fudging ring. James Kaburu, Chief Finance Officer. Nina Shah, Head of Treasury. Robinson Bore, Risk Manager. Peter Nzuki, Manager, Credit. Alisaga Esmalji, Assistant Manager, Credit. Mebuba Shamji, Senior Business Development Manager. On the central bank side, you have Jungun Ndungo as the Governor. Peter Gatere, an Assistant Director. Ruben Cheres, the manager in charge of banking supervision. Matu Mogo, the assistant director of banking supervision. Alex Nandi, also an assistant director of banking supervision. Simon Geshuki, Medin Njerik Hara, Daniel Thogo, Caroline Mobobia, Simeon K. Rono, R.G. Langat, and J.A. Migude. Are, are, are all these things really serious? Are they honest, all these endeavors? You wonder. When the whole IBL thing uh, broke out, you got the feeling that they were more working towards hiding their culpability rather than being open and trying to resolve what was happening. So they, I believe very strongly that the action to close down IBL and to block anyone from accessing any information was not in the interest of depositors. It was not to hold the the directors culpable, it was to protect the image and the involvement of some of the top CBK staff. Um, and that was wrong. Initially, Imperial Bank, when they found out about this fraud going on, they appointed FTI. That report is very, very clear that the fraud was there. but. Central Bank is also implicated in that fraud. And they covered up the whole story that everything is fine and nothing is wrong. And they gave a clean bill of health. And the penalties must be heavy for, for accuracy. If you don't have that, you'll have what perhaps you are referring to the experience of collusions between and where reports are prepared for the specters. The specters just, perhaps they just take some incentive given to them and they move out. They sh it, it would have been much better if they had acknowledged what had gone wrong. They had said this is where CBK failed because he was new at, at that point. He had a chance to make it right. But what did he do? He, he chose to cover up. Yes? He chose to cover up and protect uh, the failures of, of, of his predecessors. It is curious, however, that we see more or less the same cast of characters in every collapse, and yet they still have the regulator's seeming protection to continue with practices that exposes depositors like you to unnecessary risk. The question is, why? You know, if you've done something in one bank that worked and worked really well, it's quite likely that you'll be tempted to try it in another bank because it might still work. And usually, you hone your tools and you do it even better somewhere else. People that were involved in money laundering yes. or people involved in drug trafficking or people, I never met them. They don't show up. They don't seek you out. And you never find them. But they have those who, use, who they, 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 they send out. They have scavengers, so to speak. The bank doesn't have powers to look at uh, how they are bringing in goods and, you know, paying out, you know, internationally, so on. But he could be perhaps involved in funding what we might call money laundering operations. You are sanitizing the fraud of those people who have done this overseas. What we would have liked to see when a governor was some arrests, not only of W. Tilly. I am seeing some bit of uh, inaction from your side. If you had actually come in and arrested those directors day one, yes. you could have sent a very strong message that uh, that the depositors, if somebody places your money, somebody will go to jail. 
we, we are not a country that knows how to give personal responsibility. Yeah? Uh, and when we do, uh, I think we see uh, some ministers are being lynched in parliament because they made some individuals take personal responsibility. Now, I think that's a, that's a failure of a system, uh, to be honest with you. I think as a, as a country, people must take personal responsibility. And we must, we must scream so that they do. Because uh, we, people are not entrusted with power or authority to abuse it. And if they do, or fail to exercise it for good of mankind, they should take personal responsibility. And so when a bank fails, the central bank, some heads should roll in the central bank. Uh, in fact, if I was the uh, president of this country and a bank is uh, shut down like Imperial Bank or Chase Bank, I don't, I won't, I won't have the central bank governor sitting in that office the following morning. To tell you the truth, they have not prosecuted even one staff of central bank. The, they have been doing auditing from the day the license was granted to the bank. How come they did not know anything about the fraud? The FTI report proved that there was a fraud. So this was the work of central bank during the audit. To find out. With the case of Imperial Bank opening the can of worms that has been bank regulation and receivership management in Kenya, and new sheriffs heading both the Central Bank and the Depositors Insurance Corporation, how different though has their approach been in managing banking crises? Well, I've, I would have done differently right from day one. I don't think, uh, you know, I don't want to go into the specifics because, I, as I said again, uh, I am a regulator and I have been a regulator uh, elsewhere. He clearly doesn't understand the Kenyan banking sector at all. He doesn't, he has, he, I, I believe he, he really doesn't have the knowledge to run the banking sector, just from the way he handled us. And Chess Bank was, was really unwarranted. It, it, it wasn't. Uh, I, I think they dealt with it very unprofessionally. Um, locking out both the directors and shareholders of the institution completely from the operation of the bank, that's what they did, uh, including even selling it, finding even bias. I, I, I don't think that was warranted and I don't think that was necessary. I don't think that's the way to do things. Um, and I think it will discourage investors and the law is also clear on that. You need to involve the shareholders and the directors of the institution on measures that you're taking. Uh, to remedy the, the, the problem that the bank is facing. I, the first person that CBK should have arrested is their own staff, for me, if they were serious. Then this staff would have told us what exactly went wrong. You cannot even prosecute any other person without the people in CBK actually disclosing what happened. You know? So for me, they were just chasing shadows. They still are chasing shadows. Um, and even if they resolve IBL, they should know that they've really had confidence um, in the Kenyan banking sector. And some of the <laughs> issues that they are going through is because of these unresolved issues with IBL, Chase Bank, and all other banks. Because I believe it's not just Phyllis who, who has resolved not to bank in Kenya. I'm sure there's so many businessmen, if you ask around, who have resolved not to bank here in Kenya. There are a lot of litigations in court now on that, and I think that directors and shareholders of the institutions have gone to court and, and claiming billions, and, 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 and you know, because of what the central bank has done, and even this issue of selling uh, the bank that they are not party to and they have not been involved in the negotiations or discussions, and the central bank should not react in a punitive uh, uh, manner, particularly when they are the ones that were uh, that are deemed culpable by, by many of us in, in the failure of those institutions. My lawyers on their initiative took the matter to court. The lawyers for Central Bank and KDIC, they do not want the case to move and they keep on frustrating. We can see the mood of the judge that he is getting very upset that all the time they are disturbing the case and not to move for hearing. All the documents were agreed upon to be taken as for hearing in the case. And when actually the hearing started this year, they started objecting that he himself, Mr. Murgor, was not present in the court when pre-trial took place. And he said he's not accepting these documents. And all the time there is a threat, I will go to court of appeal. What? 
going to court of appeal who is no we are not afraid we are not criminals we don't mind but that is all to do is to delay the cases Within the Kenyan banking sector, it appears that the more things change, the more they remain the same. And unless the regulator has the will to peel back the mask and expose the real faces behind the conduits and the businesses fronting for these faceless culprits, the Kenyan depositor will be as exposed tomorrow as they are today. We don't have money. We are still in court. Um, IBL, IBL case is still not resolved. It's, it's a case that has broken my heart to a point where um, I, I've, I became helpless. I became helpless and the only option that I was left with is to keep fighting through the courts to see whether there's some form of justice that can come. Between the time IBL closed and now we have lost so many people. Um, I believe if we had money, we, we would have saved some of them, especially the children, uh, the children and the young women in the community. The regulator must take some responsibility for that. How does that happen? Huh? Did you suspect? Because if you suspect that some funny things are happening there, you should be a little more proactive in trying to find out in trying to find as a regulator. And you are able to even ask for help from other institutions whose law allows them to go and unearth, you know, what is going on. Our central bank is under the capture of our commercial banks. In fact, the, the central bank, our regulator in Kenya, is no longer playing the role of a regulator. Does not even serve the interests of the people of Kenya. It's serving the interest of the bankers. If this had happened in any other developed country, Jeroge should have been fired. And I think for the sake of the future, we, we still have to go back and audit his decisions, especially concerning Imperial Bank. We must audit his decisions because at some point it was clear that he was making singular decisions without a board, you know, very dangerous. Um, he goes to parliament, he's very arrogant. He hides culpability of his own staff. Um, so you wonder, was he brought in because he's professional or was he brought in because he could serve some interests, you know? Was he brought in in the interest of Kenyans or was he brought in to serve specific interests? Because if it was the interest of Kenyans, he should have been transparent. He was new in that place. He really should have disclosed publicly what went on. I will never compromise on anything which will either dent, damage, diminish, use any D of the depositor's interest. The worst thing that ever happens in the life of a governor is to see an institution collapse. It's like a mother seeing a child die. We want to reopen Chase Bank to continue opening. We cannot tolerate um, rock bunkers. KDIC Kenya was rated the best deposit insurance in the world.